Pulling Princes, A Royal Christmas. The invitation read, His Royal Highness Frederick Windsor requests the company of Calypso Kelly at Windsor Castle, 2 p.m., December 27th to the 1st of January. Activities to include New Year's Eve party, dress, restoration, decadence. The helicopter had only barely ascended when I first began to peer prematurely over the skyscrapers and rooftops of West London for an early glimpse of the fields of my old boarding school, St Augustine's School for Ladies, and the nearby rambling village of Eton College. Between the two lay Puller's Woods, in reality the heartbeat of my adolescence, an ancient wood spanning 20 acres which divided our two single-sex schools but which was heavily guarded by security do dogs security guards and nuns, all of whom we foiled on a regular basis in our determination to pull. The two schools were in walking distance of Windsor Castle, very handy for Fred's his royal hotness as he was known at St Augustine's for Exia weekend, certainly handier than LA from where I commuted back and forth between terms. Even with my history with Fred's, I was excited to be going to a house party at Windsor Castle though not as excited as my parents, Sarah and Bob. They'd actually wanted to escort me there. Eventually, I managed to make them see that at 24, it might seem a tiny bit bizarre to descend on Windsor Castle, home to kings and queens of Britain since the 11th century, with my parents in tow. Sarah's cunning idea was for me to say I needed them to help with my bags. Of course, many of the guests would have brought their own valets, dresses, makeup artists and hairdressers, Many of the girls of St Augustine's and the Old Etonians travelled with staff. Many still lived on Daddy's plastic and Mummy's contacts, even now we're in our mid-twenties. The not-so-honourable Honey O'Air was particularly pleased with herself, the term she turned up with a Buddhist bodyguard. Buddhist bodyguards being the last thing in now, darling. I tried not to think of my seven years at St Augustine's, but now they played in my mind like scratched old Super 8 footage as the helicopter headed towards Windsor Castle. For all the grim food, rubbish heating and the cost of, cost of frankly bonkers eccentrics in charge of our intellectual and pastoral care, there is nothing like the English public school system for creating timeless jolly hockey sticks memories, memories that cannot be created anywhere else. Whether you walk through the gates as the daughter or son of a Texan millionaire, a rock star, a duke, a Russian oligarch, a Nigerian princess, or like me, a middle class American, you will walk out of those same gates with the product of the English public school system. Every time you open your mouth, you will be identified as such. Of course, everyone is a product of their upbringing, but in the case of ex-public schoolers, it's not just about the way you speak, it's a class thing. It's the unique experience of the traditions and the intimacy that develops when you're growing up living with all your friends and frenemies. That closeness could not have been created anywhere other than, an, at, the, than at an English public school. The grainy Super 8 footage now flickering through my mind, reeling with images of midnight dorm feasts and raids, snuggling into bed together at night to agonize, agonize over texts from boys or flick through the pages of Tatler's Bystander. There's a special shared intimacy living with your friends far from your family. You develop a private language and of course there are all the experiences that simply don't translate to anyone who went to normal school. Things like being chased by octogenarian nuns in long habits whose idea of punishment, once they'd rugby tackled you to the ground, was a decade of the rosary and a glory be to the father. There is the endless texting and Facebooking after lights out, dashing through the bluebell pathways en route to illicit trysts with boys in Puller's Woods, rinsing jumped up boys on the fencing cell, potty bearded house mothers, some dear, some not so dear. When we were older, our escapades to London on the night train, using our fake ideas and ebullient confidence to blag our way into bougie and other hotspots of London. 
Perhaps most of all, what divides public school from ordinary or private schools is the bonds created by living within a system ruled by inexplicably odd traditions and centuries-old laws that after a while seem quite normal to you, until one evening at a cocktail party you start chatting about school days with someone educated at a normal school and you realise how utterly strange and incomprehensible you sound. In the cockpit of the helicopter, chopping its way over the rooftops of London, the scratchy, flickering Super 8 footage continued to play on in my mind, each frame spliced with painful stills of my romance with Fred's, the prince who was hosting this post-Christmas knees-up at Windsor Castle. For though I had tried not to let it define me, I had once gone out with Fred's, his royal hotness, we dated on and off for years, in fact. Seemingly, I held some gripping attention, attraction, sorry for him. Only back then I hadn't known what that secret attraction was. But despite all the media madness and feeding frenzy that had swept up everyone at both, both St. Augustine's and Eton in its tornado of facts and fantasy. Pupils, teachers, boards of governors and parents, Sarah and Bob had gone quite potty over it. I had loved him and I had thought Fred's had loved me. My on again, off again romance with Fred's dominated my time at St. Augustine's and in too many ways it did define me. The details of all the marvellous, wondrous, pinch yourself splendour of it all was still a part of me, still inside me, mummified and entombed, waiting to be excavated, waiting for me to break the seal and breathe life into it all again, and in the vivid, brilliant, piercing glow of glorious retrospect, I longed to do just that.